before you leave today, make sure that you pick up the lab that's in the top tray. Um, because for tomorrow, so really the only homework is to do the pre-lab for tomorrow. If you pick up the lab, you're going to see that the procedure is a whole four steps. So um, it's just purpose procedure. There are no pre-lab questions, uh, but you just want to make sure that you grab that so that way you have the um, lab and you can work through the pre-lab. Um, and so for the do now, there are four questions up here, and this is going to help us kind of transition into looking at calculating delta G and what delta G means. So for number one, how are entropy, which is delta S, and enthalpy, which is delta H, related? And I said, what is the formula on your equation sheet that relates them? So remember, on your equation sheet, you have a lot of different equations under thermodynamics. One of the equations has delta G, delta H, and delta S all in the same equation. So if you look on your equation sheet, you have this equation, delta G equals delta H minus T times delta S. And we'll talk about this equation a little bit more and what each of the variables represents. We'll do some calculations with it. But this is how we can relate delta G, which is free energy, enthalpy, T is temperature, and delta S, which is entropy. And then number two, looking at delta G, how can you tell if a process is spontaneous? What is the sign of delta G if something is spontaneous? Negative. So number two, we just have a negative delta G. The point of delta G is to tell us if a reaction is spontaneous, if a reaction will happen on its own. That's the purpose of delta G. On number three, so this is just going back and reviewing standard conditions. Standard conditions are different than STP. So STP we talked about when we did gases. Standard conditions, that is what this not symbol, looks like a degree symbol, represents. It represents standard conditions. That is room conditions. So in terms of pressure, that's one ATM. What is room temperature roughly? 25 degrees Celsius or 298 Kelvin, depending on uh, which temperature scale you want to use, 25 degrees Celsius or 298 Kelvin. Those are standard conditions. That differs from STP um, in the temperature. And then number four, this is going to be useful as we start thinking about calculating delta G and focusing on equations that relate all three variables. So each variable tells us something different. We can use them to calculate each other, but each variable represents something different. So delta G, we looked at in number two. Delta G tells us if a reaction is spontaneous. So delta G tells us if a reaction is spontaneous. So I'll say spontaneity. We'll talk about another word that's used um, from College Board, but Delta G, the purpose of Delta G is to, is to tell us, will a reaction happen on its own? That's spontaneity. Delta H, the purpose of Delta H, the only thing that Delta H tells us is whether a reaction is exo or endothermic. So the sign of Delta H tells us whether a reaction is exo or endothermic. So if you see you have a negative delta H, all that tells you is that the reaction is exothermic. And then delta S tells us the disorder, either the order or disorder. Delta S, the only thing that we can get from delta S is whether the reaction is becoming more disordered or more ordered. We could figure out delta S from a balanced equation or from the phase change that's occurring. 
we can use delta H and delta S to figure out delta G, but each variable tells us something different. And we'll use those variables to help us as we calculate more today. Questions? Is T always going to be common? Yes. So when we start looking at this, we're going to look at this on the next slide and then the slide after. Um, T, temperature, always has to be in Kelvin because we want the absolute temperature. So we don't ever want negatives. So we'll always put temperature in Kelvin. And the reason that we put that in Kelvin as well is because entropy is joules per Kelvin and we want that to cancel. Yep. Other? All right, so. So for calculating delta G, um, I want to go through the three main ways that we can calculate delta G. And two of the ways are equations, both of which are on your equation sheet. Now we've looked at the second and third way before. We've just used delta H instead of delta G. So the three different ways, and really it's based on what you're given in the problem. The first way is we can use this equation, delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. So we can calculate delta G, we can determine whether a reaction is spontaneous or not by using the delta H and the delta S values if those are given to us. So this relates enthalpy, entropy, and temperature to allow us to solve for delta G. The second way that we could calculate delta G so notice both of these are calculating the overall free energy of a reaction is to use the free energies of formation. We looked at this yesterday with entropy. We've looked at it also with delta H. This is also on your equation sheet. So if the problem gives you free energies of formation, then we know that we're going to be using this method. And then the third way is what are called coupled reactions. That is Hess's law. So you have two different reactions. You have to manipulate those reactions to get a new overall reaction. Like we did with delta H, you can do the exact same thing with delta G. We're not going to focus as much on this third way as we are this first and second way. Um, but the question I always get is, how do you know which one of these to use? And if there are so many different ways, how do we know which one to use? And it's really based on what we're given. If we are given a delta H and a delta S for a reaction, then it's going to make more sense to use this equation. If we're given free energies of formation, it's going to make more sense to use this equation. So we just have to pay attention to what we're given to figure out how we can solve for delta G. And again, the purpose of solving for delta G is that it allows us to determine whether a reaction is spontaneous. Will a reaction happen on its own? So if we take a look at this first way. So this first way is delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. And this was in the video, but just to review this, you need to know these different conditions. If delta G is negative, the reaction is spontaneous. If it's positive, it is not spontaneous. If delta G equals zero, this is when something is at equilibrium. Phase changes are at equilibrium. We're going to look at an example that's having us focus on a phase change. You can calculate the temperature. You can calculate the melting point or the boiling point of something because delta G is zero when it's going through a phase change, when the reaction is at equilibrium. Now, I talked about this in the video as well, uh, but AP has kind of shifted the terminology from spontaneous to what they say as thermodynamically favorable. You can still use spontaneous, but know that if you see something that says, is the reaction thermodynamically favorable, it's asking you, is it spontaneous? Um, the reason that they've shifted this language is because just because a reaction is spontaneous doesn't mean that it happens fast. Think about, for example, on a car. 
over time a car rusts right you can you see rust occurring over time that's a spontaneous reaction but it happens over a really long time so just because a reaction is spontaneous doesn't mean it happens quickly a lot of the stuff we look at in lab happens quickly because we don't have years to wait for an experiment so if you see thermodynamically favorable that just means it's spontaneous it occurs on its own that is the purpose of delta g when we use this equation like we talked about t is kelvin but pay attention to units we're going to look at some examples delta g and delta h are given in kilojoules per mole entropy is typically in joules per mole kelvin so always pay attention to units so let's go ahead Oh, you have to look at this one. Nope, nope. Yeah. So here's the other way, right, with the free energy of formation. And just to focus on this, again, this is where Appendix C comes in. I'm going to show you examples where you are given the free energies of formation because you're given the free energies just like you're given the heats of formation on tests and quizzes. But for this, do you remember how the heat of formation for any element in its most stable state was zero? It's the same thing for free energy. So O2 gas, that's how oxygen exists in nature. Its free energy of formation is zero. So if you are not given a free energy of formation and it's an element, more than likely it's zero. This is also on your equation sheet. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at an at example seven. So if you flip in your notes to example seven, for this example, it says, what is the temperature at which sodium chloride melts? And I said, solid and liquid states are in equilibrium at this temperature. The enthalpy of melting is 30.3 kilojoules per mole, and the entropy change upon melting is 28.2 joules per mole Kelvin. Now, here's what I would recommend doing first. Write out your variables. Write out all of your variables. Because then you can check units, and you can see what you're given that might be useful. So first, this is asking me to solve for temperature. So my variable I'm solving for is temperature. It tells me the enthalpy. Enthalpy is delta H. So the enthalpy of melting is 30.3 kilojoules per mole. The entropy change, that's delta S, is 28.2 joules per mole Kelvin. I know I'm solving for temperature, so I'm just going to do T with a question mark. And if that's where I was at first, if that's all I wrote down, and I said, okay, well, how could I solve this? Start by looking at your equation sheet. See if there is an equation that ties in delta H, delta S, and T. And when we look at the equation sheet, we see that there is one that ties all three together. And it's this. Delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. There's delta H, there's T, there's delta S. But we need delta G. This is why it's important that it says this is at equilibrium. Delta G is zero. Again, delta G is zero because this system is at equilibrium. Now, it's very easy for everyone to be like, all right, I got my variables. I'm going to plug them in. Double check your units before you plug them in. Because I have kilojoules, kilojoules, and joules. I think the easiest thing to do is just to convert delta S then you're just converting one but really it's up to you 
I want to put this in kilojoules to match the other two. But what I can do is I can divide by 1,000. Because I'll show you up here. If I have 28.2 joules per mole Kelvin, there are 1,000 joules in one kilojoule. So by dividing by 1,000, that cancels out joules, and that gives me kilojoules per mole Kelvin. That per mole Kelvin is OK, because notice these are all per mole, so that's fine. So 28.2 divided by 1,000 is 0.0282 kilojoules per mole Kelvin. Now we have everything matching up with units. Now we can plug everything in. So delta G is zero. Delta H, 30.3. Solving for T times delta S, 0 0.0282. Now it becomes an algebra problem. So if I add 0 0.0282t to the other side, divide to solve for t, <sighs> just do four same things, 1,074. Now if you check your units, this is why temperature is in Kelvin, because entropy is also given in Kelvin. So the temperature, the melting point, the melting point of sodium chloride is 1,074 Kelvin. So anything above this temperature, so above 1,074, melting is spontaneous. So if we're at 1,080 Kelvin, sodium chloride would melt spontaneously. If we're below 1,074, melting is not spontaneous. I know that there's a question on mastering that asks what happens if you're above the melting point or below the melting point. I always say think about it like water. At 20 degrees Celsius, if we're in this room, it's going to melt. Put it in the freezer, it's below zero degrees Celsius, it's not going to melt. So you can figure out the melting point or the boiling point by remembering that during a phase change, delta G is zero. Questions on this one? So there are some examples I'm going to have you do with groups. So if you want to move around and you want to sit next to somebody, um, you can. Because example eight is one that I'm going to actually have you, um, you can do. If you want to do it on your own, that's fine. But I'm going to have you try it with partner just to see if you can solve everything. Think about units. So example eight says at 298 Kelvin. At 298 Kelvin, delta G is 190.5 kilojoules, and delta H is negative 184.6 kilojoules for this reaction. Calculate the standard entropy, delta S, for the reaction. So in this example, think about what you have. Well, I see that I have temperature, I have delta G, I have delta H. And it wants delta S. So you can look at your equation sheet. See if you can solve for delta S. Whichever units you pick to give at the end is up to you. But as you work through this, I'm going to work through it up here as well. And then we can check answers. Be careful with your negatives when you're working through problems with delta G, delta H, and delta S. So when you solve for delta S out of this equation, 
and I tried to include units so that you could see um, how I got what I got here. Because this is negative 184, you add 184.6 to the other side, you get negative 5.9 kilojoules equals negative 298 times delta S because this is minus 298. When you divide, you get 0 0.0198 kilojoules per Kelvin. Now, typically, entropy is given in joules per Kelvin, not kilojoules per Kelvin. But this didn't specify. So if you left it like this, that's fine. If it said go to joules per Kelvin, I'll remember that one kilojoule is 1,000 joules. So you multiply by 1,000, it's 19.8 joules per Kelvin. Again, if you did not convert, that's okay. It didn't specify what units it wanted. But just make sure that you do give units, whether it's kilojoules per Kelvin or joules per Kelvin. Questions on this example? All right, so go ahead and take a look at example nine. This is actually giving you uh, delta G values, and it's just asking, is the reaction spontaneous or not? So for example nine, talk to people around you, and you're just answering, is it spontaneous? Is it not spontaneous? Think about how you tell. There's no math involved with this, because they give you delta G. You can check the answers, for example, 9. You had spontaneous, because delta G was negative, at equilibrium, because delta G was 0, and then not spontaneous or non-spontaneous, in C, because delta G is positive. So to figure out if something is spontaneous, look at the sign of delta G. That is the point of delta G, to tell us if a reaction is spontaneous or not. So then we're going to take a look at example 10. So now, this says, given these free energies of formation. So now we're given delta GF. So that's the free energy of formation of each of these substances. Calculate delta G for the oxidation of glucose. So now we want to calculate delta G for this reaction. Well, now I notice I don't have a delta H, I don't have a delta S. But we are given these free energies of formation. So since we're given the free energy of formation, it would make more sense to use this equation. Products minus the sum of the free energy of formation of reactants. Remember to take into account, take into account the coefficients. So I'll give you some time, work with a partner, somebody around you, see if you can plug in these free energy of formations into here. Now, as you look at this, I always get one question. Why don't I see the free energy of oxygen? Where is it? Zero. Right, it's zero. zero. The free energy of formation of oxygen gas is zero because oxygen gas is its most stable form. So use this oxidation uh, reaction, plug in the free energies of formations, products minus all of the reactants, See what you get for delta G. Remember when you multiply by the coefficients, you're canceling out that per mole part. And then based on the answer that you get, see if you can tell me whether the reaction is spontaneous or not. Based on what you get, tell me if it's spontaneous or not. Once you have an answer, you can check up here, see if you got the same thing. You don't have to worry as much about significant figures. Uh, technically, this is four sig figs. I gave it in five, but 
long as you're within one, you're okay. Biggest thing though is that your delta G should be negative, meaning that the reaction is spontaneous or thermodynamically favorable. It means it happens on its own. So we're gonna pause here because the bell's gonna ring. Um, so take a quick break in between. He'll come back, we'll do one more example. Um, and then we're gonna look at three practice questions. Two of them are multiple choice, so we'll go pretty quickly. And you'll have some time to work on the pre-lab um, or mastering. But I'll leave this up so you can check your answer. So the last example uh, that we are going to look at is example 11. So example 11 says, given the following data, so we have these three heats of formation, right? Delta HF is heat of formation. We have these um, molar entropies, so standard entropy of formation. And then we have this question that says, calculate delta G for the reaction. And so this wants us to calculate delta G. And it gives us a reaction. This question, and, and I'll have you try it with, uh, with your partners, but this takes a couple steps. Now, again, if you take a look at what you have, well, I see that it's asking me for delta G. And I have delta H and I have delta S. So since I have all of those variables, I could use delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. But in order to use this, because remember, this is for the reaction, which means this is delta H of the overall reaction, and this is delta S of the overall reaction. We actually need to solve for delta H and delta S first. So this is why it's a multiple step problem. So in this, we actually need to solve for delta H of the reaction using heats of formation. So the sum of the heat of formation of products minus the sum of the heat of formation of reactants. Do the same thing for entropy, right? The sum of the entropy of products minus the sum of the entropy of reactants. And then we can plug those into here. Now we still don't have temperature, but this not symbol, what looks like a degree symbol, that not symbol means we are at standard conditions. So if we are at standard conditions, that means we're at 298 Kelvin. So see if you can use all of this information to solve for delta H of reaction, solve for delta S of reaction, and then plug them in and solve for delta G. So remember that this delta H of reaction, the delta S of reaction, those are on your equation sheet. You're just adding up the products and you're subtracting all of the reactants. Remember to pay attention to units because when you solve for delta H, that's kilojoules per mole. When you solve for delta S, that's joules per Kelvin mole. I have everything worked out up here so you can see I have delta H have delta S, pay attention to units. Why is O2 not zero? For entropy, your values are not zero um, because the only time that you have zero entropy, the only time you have zero disorder is if you're at zero Kelvin. Oh, so you know it's in the standard state. It's not yes, entropy is never zero. Uh, yeah. Makes sense. Yep, so the only time, so only delta H and delta G have zero in their most stable state. Um, but delta S, because that's disorder, you're always going to have some degree of disorder. 
And then when you solve, delta H is in kilojoules. Um, delta S was joules per Kelvin, so I converted to kilojoules per Kelvin. Just pay attention to negatives because it's minus T times delta S. So minus 298 times negative 5.43, no, 0.543. You actually have a negative, and you're actually adding that value in because of the two negatives after. I got negative 1,490 kilojoules. Now, if you didn't round to three sig figs and you had something a little bit different, that's okay. The importance is showing your work through all of this. But this shows a negative delta G. This shows that the reaction is spontaneous. The purpose of delta G is to tell us if a reaction is thermodynamically favorable. Is it spontaneous? Will it happen on its own? This shows us yes. This is rust. This is actually the reaction for rust. So we can see that the process of rust or, or iron undergoing oxidation to form rust is spontaneous, but we don't see it happen at a fast rate. We would say it's under kinetic control. So it just happens over time. Questions on this example? So this is actually one that I would consider kind of a challenge question because it took multiple steps to solve for delta G. Um, and so you just have to pay attention to what are you given? What are you trying to find? There can be different ways to solve. I've had people before do um, delta G equals H minus T delta S for each one of these. And then plug it all in. Um, but typically, this is going to be the best way to do delta H. Solve for delta S. Plug it all in using the temperature. Yeah. So I started off with converting like 90, 27, 205 divided by 1,000. Mm -hmm. I, I can do that too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If you start and you divide all of these, you should get an answer around this for um, when you solve for delta S. And that's fine because then you just plug that right in. Yeah. And again, it might be a little bit different because then these numbers are going to be a little bit different as well. So that's fine. It depends on how you round. Um, whether you leave it in your calculator, but that's why as long as you're showing your work, you're good. Okay, so then what I want to do is I want to look at this table that was from 9.4, and we're going to spend more time with this over the next couple of days, but um, for this, this is looking at how spontaneity depends on temperature, and I guess also how spontaneity depends on delta H and delta S. So we have this equation, delta G equals H minus T delta S. And we know that for a reaction to be spontaneous, delta G has to be zero. Not zero, negative. Jeez. All right, delta G has to be negative. If it's zero, it's at equilibrium. But to be spontaneous, it has to be negative. So there are two conditions that we always know the sign of delta G. And the two conditions are when the signs are not the same. If we have a negative delta H, that means it's an exothermic reaction. And we have a positive delta S, that means it's becoming more disordered. That reaction is always spontaneous. Because remember, nature wants low energy and high disorder. That's what nature wants. And so since nature wants low energy and high disorder, the, the reaction will always be spontaneous. It will always happen on its own. If we have the other, so it's endothermic, that means we have to put energy in, and it's highly ordered, so a negative delta S. That will never be spontaneous. No matter what temperature the reaction is at, it will never be spontaneous. Nature does not want lots of energy and lots of order. 
So that will always be non-spontaneous. Now, if the signs are the same, that is when temperature comes into play. So if we have a reaction that is exothermic and ordered, so the signs are the same, spontaneity will change as temperature changes. Now, low and high temperature, those are generalizations. There's no uh, value that's considered low versus high because it's all dependent on what these values are. So let's say we have a reaction that is, uh, we have negative 300 kilojoules per mole. That's our delta H. We have a temperature. And remember that delta S, we always have to convert to joules. We have to convert from joules to kilojoules. So let's say that our entropy is also negative. Let's say it's something like 0 0.020 kilojoules per Kelvin. Well, notice how you have minus T times a negative number. Looking at this as temperature varies, requires you to really think about the algebra that's involved. So if I have negative 300 minus T times a negative number, negative times a negative is a positive. All right, something like this. I'm just making up numbers. Notice how if we're at a low temperature, something like 10 Kelvin, delta G is going to be negative. So when the signs are the same, negative and negative, when they're both negative, at low temperatures, the reaction will be spontaneous. We will get up to a certain temperature. One, two, three, I don't know, 10,000 Kelvin. Right, we, we will get up to some high temperature where this variable ends up being larger than this variable. Well, now you're adding more and more and more and more until eventually delta G becomes positive. So at high temperatures, it would become non-spontaneous or not spontaneous or not thermodynamically favored. And then you could look at the same thing if they're both positive. All right, so if you have this being positive 100 and this being you know, positive 0.01, At low temperatures, it's not going to be spontaneous because this T times delta S is not big enough to outweigh the delta H. But then temperature gets higher and higher and higher, and eventually this quantity becomes larger. So let's say you have 100 minus 200. Well, now this has finally become larger. Delta G will eventually become negative. So if the signs are the same, temperature will change spontaneity. If we have different signs, nature always likes low energy and lots of disorder, never likes lots of energy and lots of order. And so that was really looking at what happens as temperature changes. And we're going to focus on that more um, over the next couple of days. I'll add more questions into the do now so that we can practice. So there are just three practice questions. Two of them are multiple choice. So here's what I'll have you guys do. I'll give you, let's see where we are in like four minutes. Because remember, multiple choice should only take a minute and a half at most. See if you can work through practice questions four, five, and six. Four, five, and six. Four and six are multiple choice. So read through the question. Think about what the question is giving you, what it's telling you, and see if you can answer these. If you get it wrong, it's fine. We can go back and we can change the answer. So four, five, and six. We'll go over the answers in just a few minutes.
So use your calculator for practice question five, four and six, you can technically do it that one. So for practice question four, this was a multiple choice question. Give you a balanced equation with a delta H value up at the top. Remember delta H only tells you whether a reaction is exo or endothermic. So then it gives us kind of the prompt for this, talks about the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. And then it says the reaction is thermodynamically favorable. Thermodynamically favorable is another way to say that this reaction is spontaneous. Then it says the signs of delta G and delta S for the reaction are which of the following. If the reaction is thermodynamically favorable, if it's spontaneous, delta G is negative. So just from that, we know that it's between B and D. Delta S is based on entropy. We don't have to do any math here. We don't have values for delta G to be able to actually solve for delta S. To determine whether entropy is positive or negative, look at the balanced equation. Remember that gases are highly, highly disordered. So since a gas is formed from an aqueous solution, we would actually see the entropy increase. We would see the entropy be positive. So gases are much, much more disordered than aqueous solutions, liquids, or solids. And so this practice question is B. Practice question five. Notice how they gave us the data for the free energy of formation. This is what a test or a quiz question would look like. They will give us these values. We will not be required to use Appendix C on the AP test. So they give us the free energy of formation. Now this is unique because this is what's called a hydrate. A hydrate, this is all one substance. So we have products, we have reactant. We can solve for delta G by adding up the heat of, or the free energy of formation of products, subtracting the free energy of formation of reactants. And so they actually awarded one point for multiplying water by two. So just for multiplying this by two, they gave you one of the points. So this is actually from College Board. This was how they scored it. So you got one point for multiplying water by two and then one point for your answer. Notice how it said units are optional. So even if you didn't have units, you still could have gotten the point. So just for paying attention to um, the coefficients, got you one of those points. And then finally, practice question six. So this is a unique question where they gave us the balanced equation up here. They gave us the delta H, and they say that K and Cl react directly to form KCl. Then it asks about the thermodynamic favorability. It's asking about the spontaneity of this reaction. And so it's asking, is it favorable or not, and what will drive this reaction? Sometimes it's both enthalpy and entropy. Sometimes it's just one or the other. So looking at this, because it says that it goes essentially to completion, that means that it happens, and right? it happens on its own. If it goes to completion, it's happening on its own. So that will make the reaction favorable. So we're looking between A and C. Delta H is negative. Nature likes exothermic reactions. Delta S is negative. You look at entropy from the balanced equation. So since delta S is negative, nature does not like order. So what actually drives this reaction to happen is the exothermic part of this. So a reaction is driven by either enthalpy or entropy or both, but nature wants exothermic and disordered. If it's exothermic, that's driving the reaction. If it's disordered, that's driving the reaction.